All right. Uh, good evening to everybody uh, present on the call today. I hope you can hear me. Uh, today's workshop is on Gandhian philosophy, and our speaker for today is Father Jerry Rosario. We know that Gandhi Jayanti falls on the 2nd of October, and it is no coincidence that our speaker for today shares the same birthday as Mahatma Gandhi. Father Jerry Rosario is a theologian, a pastor, a spiritual counselor, and a retreat facilitator. Aside from this, he is also a writer, a social activist, a motivator, and a civil lawyer. He is the founder director of four movements. One such movement is called Dhanam, which is concerned with human organ donations. Another movement is Manitham, which is for political analysts and action. In the spirit of giving, he has donated his blood 207 times as of March this year. As a result, he ranks first among the highest number of blood donors in India. He has signed documents known as the Living Will, expressing his will to donate his vital organs and body after his death to the needy and also for medical research. Without further ado, let's welcome Father Jerry Rosario. It's good to have you here, Father. Over to you. Thank you so much, Laila. I'm indeed, it is my privilege, almost a grace and blessing to stand before you this evening to share some reflections, some messages, some insights, some inspirations, and also some invitations born out of the man and the message of Mahatma Gandhiji. I really grateful to the province of Goa, provincial and others who have recommended my name and pulled me into this particular exercise this evening. Originally supposed to be three days, came down to two days, that is yesterday and today. But some misinformation went by and accordingly we have got only one day this day. We'll make this day quite blessed one, graceful one, spirited one, so that at the end of the session at eight o'clock, we go with certain sparks and certain challenges for a way of life. I'd like to begin my reflections referring to a sociological insight. The sociology would say at any time of history, at any given time and space, and there will be broadly speaking, three types of people, three patterns of people, about 20 percentage, plus or minus, 20 percentage. And they will be what we call, what they call, the sociologists call CG group, come and go group. They come into the world, put in their presence. And when the moment of their departure comes, they disappear. And the history may not, generally speaking, refer to them, recollect about them, and they disappear as such. Plus or minus 20 percent each. Then comes a second pattern, second time, and the second category, a huge percentage, 65 percent each. Over two thirds of the humanity, they are known as BS group. If the first one is CG, and that is come and go, the second one is BS. Do something group, do something group. And then that means they do something in their very given life span of time. And they bring certain beauty, certain quality, certain nobility, certain humanity to the history and what not. Comparatively speaking, the second category is rather better, better compared to the first time who just come and go. The second group is now the celebrator and their deaths and departures will be also commemorated. But comes the third time and they are only plus or minus 15 percentage. Uh, as per the percentage, that's a tiny minority compared to 20 first time and the 65 the second time, just about 15 percentage plus or minus. But their number may be rather small. The quantity may be rather small, but the quality of those personalities and the contributions that they make to the history and humanity are rather, that is rather huge. 
and they make an impact. And they give certain new orientation. They engineer breakthroughs. And they also have certain imagination in terms of their future and their new future. And they have got certain futuristic uh, perspectives of life. They are not satisfied with it just doing to the present time and space. As for the sociologists, and they are visionaries. They have the courage to dream and courage to do. I'm putting it a little theologically, if not philosophically, and that is they have got vision and they have got passion. And the vision plus passion equal to mission. They are not only visionaries, they are also passionate. They are ready to go through the passion, go through the suffering, go through the pain, and go through the difficulties of the challenges that they have undertaken. But still, still, and still, they will keep going, keep growing without any much of hesitation, limitation, or restriction. Not that they will uh, taste the fruits during their life. They may uh, test the fruits only after their departure, so to say. That means the future generations will look back and then salute and congratulate, appreciate, much more applaud, and they will like to appropriate the third type of people. They are people full of zeal, and there's such a hunger and thirst for humanity. They are ready to empty themselves and so that others may have life and life in abundance. I can go on, but I like to finish yeah, my first reference or my first thought with this particular note. At the end of this session, you and I should have that particular conviction that you need to, I need to, we need to belong to the third time. That's the point. That's my prayer to the Lord as I begin my presentation. And that's my petition to the divine. And that's my supplication. And you will certainly vibrate with me that that should be the prayer. It's not only throwing the spotlight on Gandhi. It's not only learning something about his philosophy. It's not only acquiring some information about his theological uh, interpretations of life. But at the end of this particular session, we need to move on to the third time. And so that we, we do not depart from this world as and when the time comes untouched and unaffecting their humanity at large. Though that particular gentleman was born on the 2nd of October, 1869, that is 19th century. And even though he departed at 5.17 p.m., on the 30th of January, 1948, that is last century, 20th century. Born in the 19th century and departed in the 20th century. But you and I today, on the 28th of, sorry, 29th of, 28th, 28th of September, 2021, we are recollecting the man for the simple reason he belongs to the third time. If he can, why not you? If he can, why not I? And that's the invitation. And this is my first point. I got about six points to share with you. I am completing my first point because within one hour, I should plus or minus 60 minutes, I should complete my presentation so that uh, we will have certain time for our interaction. And then we make this particular program quite productive and quite purposeful and quite focused at the same time, quite impact making as such. We accept the challenge. At the same time, we put in a petition to the law that as Mogandas, Karant, and Gandhi belong to the third time, that you and I also should, in one way or other, come to that particular time in order to contribute to the humanity and to the cosmos creation at large. I'm moving to the second point. And the second point is going to be a very interesting one. What is that one? 
exactly under a years ago. That was the year 1921. And that was again the month of September. Today it's uh, September the 28th. But something happened in the life of the Mohandas, Karams and Gandhiji. And that happened on the 22nd, 22nd of September, 1921, where at Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Now I am speaking from Tamil Nadu with a certain joy in my heart. I talk to you. Why? Something happened to him on that day, 22nd of September, uh, 1921. The previous day, 21st of September, Gandhi had arrived Madurai, Madurai, the city of Madurai, and he was well received. And people coming from the periphery, the very poorest, and the farmers, peasants, workers, and women folk all gathered together uh, to welcome me. And it was a very rousing welcome. And they certainly gave me a lot of uh, joy and consolation. But at the end of the day, on the 21st of September 1921, Gandhiji went through a certain dilemma. And that was nothing but this. Namely, the people who came to receive him in big number, in a huge number, and they were so, so poor. They did not have any proper dress. And much more, the men for nothing. And well dressed, uh, as gesture, and they did not have anything over. And they had simple dhoti. Even the women folk, they did not have any, what you call, decent dress, so to say. Though they are coming big number to receive me. I tell you that night, as per his own confession later, he went through a kind of a crisis of his life, a challenge of his life, and then he also got a conviction for his life thereafter. The following morning, 22nd of September, 1921, he appeared in that particular uh, balcony. It was a kind of a single floor and tiled house. And the house number 251, still there. The West Massey Street in Madurai City. Gandhi, 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 happy birthday is coming on Jason, on second. On... Sorry, brother. Sorry about that. And when, when Gandhi came out the following morning, the people got stunned. If they got even shocked. They saw Gandhi without any shirt on. He has given up the Gujarati attire. He already lived with a meager food. True. He lived with a minimum, uh, what you call, uh, accommodation. He only slept over thin mattress and whatnot. But uh, as far as the food, uh, uh, this is concerned, that revolution took place on the 22nd of September, uh, that is 1921, as I said it more than once. I tell you, thereafter, now look at all the images, all the pictures, all the statues, icons of Gandhiji, and there are bad churches. And this is a centenary year. In Tamil Nadu, we call it this revolution. But that's a simple one. It looks as such. But it has a substance to and a challenge to underline. What is that one? That's a mark of solidarity. Even though we got independence thereafter, our 26th thereafter. But he said, even the people who are at the periphery, on the margins and sidelines, they should have a greater life. And they uh, need to have as uh, they need to have a decent life in course of time. He had their vision. And he wanted to go through that particular passion. So that a life mission comes not only to get the independence, so to say, the freedom from British Raj, but much more, much more, much more. The people should have a greater life, nobler life, and then they should have a, what we call it, uh, in a way, uh, they should live their humanity to the fullest possible. For which he was ready for another thing. And that's why we salute him. And this year, as a mark, uh, as a is as a centenary year of that particular uh, dhoti or a uh, dust revolution, revolution, 
again comes a message for you and message for me. What is that one? We can always talk about uh, the poor, the poorest. We can always uh, discuss about the marginalized. And we can deliberate over the sidelined. And we can certainly pray for them. And much more, we can also work out certain academic exercise and uh, explanations about the poverty at large and what not. But here comes the message. As I said, it's a challenge. Namely, even to talk about the poor, poorest, or the poorest of the poor, we need to have something in terms of solidarity. And we need to have our something manifested in our very presence. And uh, Gandhi, in course of time, referred to that particular day as a day of transformation. He used the word, day of transformation. He transformed him to a greater soul. And so that he can vibrate with the people who are at the lower steps, the lower steps of the ladder of the society. Solidarity. And uh, he used the word transformation. And today we use the word that is nothing but a manifestation and a very, what you call, inspiring manifestation of uh, solidarity. But you kindly permit me to add another word. That is spirituality. Spirituality. And we need to even concretize our spirituality. And the solidarity, again, a demanding feature of spirituality. Here again, in the very my second point, I like to have a note of little addition. What is that one? Namely, the title that is given to me, the focus that is given to me, even in the introduction that was highlighted, this is Gandhian philosophy. I wish to differ a bit. Why? They call all other things as philosophy, as if only Christianity can have theology. No, no. I like to label it Gandhian theology. You will see during my presentation, it's not, it's not exactly philosophy. It's more than philosophy. And the philosophical understandings and definitions and the descriptions and the dimensions can be without any touch of the divinity. But Gandhi was not like that. Gandhi had a profound experience of the divine. It is there a little earlier I said. And then was afterwards, even when he went to uh, London for the round table conference in the year 1931, then Prime Minister even called him off naked fucking churches called him. And he says he's a Hindu dictator, Churchill. It's a semi barbarous personality, Churchill again. But Gandhi did not want to change. And he received those comments rather kindly and benignly. Why? That is his spirituality. That is part of his passion. And he knew that at the time participating in the round table conference, he is not only participating as Morgan Das, Morgan das and Gandhi, but he is representing the people of the country of India. And he wanted to see that they really come up in life. And accordingly, he worked toward his own theological uh, explanations and explorations and expressions. There is a Gandhian theology. Though I also tend to put it Gandhism, but I have to hesitate uh, as I know I'm talking to you. Why? Gandhi himself dismissed that term. He said, no, he saw. Though that speaks well, but he also dismissed it. However, as I said a little earlier, we have come together to reflect on Gandhian philosophy, but it's much more Gandhian theology. And the solidarity with the least and the last is nothing but a definitive disclosure of one's own spirituality. From here, I move on to the, my third point. As I said earlier, there are six points. Now I am already coming to the third point. Very interesting one. Gandhi had a, what you call it, unique vision. Unique vision of the divine. On that December the 8th, 1931, 
he was addressing a mammoth meeting in Switzerland. During the particular deliberation or the presentation or the speech, Gandhi made a profound observation about his own search. He said, from my childhood onward, I have been going through number of names of God. And he himself uses the word, I even got, when I started collecting, he even crossed the number 1,000 names. And he said he went through all the Hindu scriptures from childhood onward. When he was talking, already he has reached what we call it, uh, 62 years. But he didn't come into this particular note. He said, I have collected uh, rather over 1,000 names for God, for the divine, for the divinity. Though he liked some of the names, like Brahman, or the name, uh, or, uh, or Bhagavan, or Ishwar. In course of time, he even started liking Maha Ishwar. And he said, in course of time, he also went into Quran. Then he went into the Bible, and especially the Gospels. And he liked Matthew and Mark, Gospels according to Matthew and Mark. They're rather dear to you. He said he went through all those scriptures of the various religions. But ultimately, he reached a point when he wanted to say, God is truth. But look at the immediate sentence. God is truth. Because the one and the only reality is the divinity. And that is perfect. None other than is perfect and cannot be perfect. In one of his writings, he also says, even Jesus Christ cannot be perfect. Because so long he was human, so long he had flesh, so long he participated in the humanity, so long he walked on this earth as a human person. He could have come somewhere near to the perfection, nearer to the perfection, but he cannot be the most perfect person. And that is his observation. However, he says there is one the most perfect being and the reality is God. Then he goes on to say that God is not just Bhagavan. It's not only what we call it um, uh, 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 Brahman. It's not only Ishwar. But he said it has to be rather personal at the same time very profound in another way, it should be rather demanding one's life in order to reach that particular reality. And according to the course of time, he arrived at this particular definition of the divinity. He said, God is truth. My dear friends, in course of time, he also made a change to his own definition. And he has said it this way. Earlier, I used to say, God is truth. But further meditations and further reflections and much more further discernment over the names of God. Now I come to another conclusion. God is truth. Okay. But truth is God. Truth is God. It's a challenging theology. It is then clearly I said, it's not philosophy. Truth can be a philosophical terminology. But he said, truth is God. In some places, it says, righteousness is God. And it can be also translated, which he here means all done it, and justice is God. Because you know, truth, justice, righteousness are synonymous terms. But he himself preferred satyam, satya, truth, sat, being. I don't know whether you have seen the movie Water. And the movie gets over with this particular scene. Gandhi was passing through Kolkata and the announcement was made around the uh, railway uh, junction, uh, station of Aura, namely saying that Gandhi is passing through and he will be for a while and staying at the uh, station. And people are gathered and he gives only a small message, but a very short message, very substantial one. And he says like this, I have told you earlier, and you heard earlier, God is truth. But now I begin to say, truth is God. See the further explanation, further explanation. He says, 
namely the ultimate embodiment of truth is the divinity. If that's the case, you and I, as a beloved children of the one and the only God, the one and the only truth, the religions can be many, cultures can be many, and the civilizations can be many, and the scriptures can be many, and the terms and traditions can be many, and the paths and the ways and means of reaching the ultimate truth can be many. But he is one and the only God. And none of the religions can reach him. Then he says, I may be a Hindu. I am like to remain in this particular by religion, Hinduism. But I can be, I am open to other scriptures. And accordingly, I have got also other scriptures. And coming into a kind of a hybrid understanding, hybrid understanding of the divinity, I come to the conclusion, truth is God. My dear friends, in the movie, The Water, the final scene is there, given this particular clippings. But I'm not going beyond that particular movie, because possibly you would have seen it. But if you now go into the writings of Gandhiji, he, uh, he also makes, to, uh, makes references to some of the scriptures. I will not take much time, but I will put it exactly and end this point before we move on to the four, point number four. What is that one? He refers to Bhagavad Gita. Since he comes from that particular uh, religion, and uh, Gita is very dear and near to him, and he was just giving discourses on Gita, and uh, referring to chapter number two and four, he would say, Lord Krishna told Arjuna, I am Dharma, I am truth. Then he would tell Arjuna, 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 make up your mind. Whether you are for Dharma or Adharma. Make up your mind whether you are for Dharma or Adharma. Once you have made up your mind, Arjuna, to stand for Dharma, where is the war against Adharma? Once you have decided, convinced of the fact that you want to get wedded and committed to the establishment of the what you call Suvaraj, namely the uh, Satyaraj and Ram Raj. And you come into that detail. He says, if you once you have made up your mind, Arjuna, wage a war against untruth, a dharma. Gaze your sight upon me. Leave the rest to me. You wage a war. Leave the rest to me. With all looking for immediate fruits, Nishkama Karma. I repeat the words of Lord Krishna. Referred to by Gandhiji in more than one places. I am Dharma. I am truth. Arjuna, make up your mind whether you are for truth, whether you are for untruth, whether you are for Dharma, or whether you are for Andharma. Once you have made up your mind that you want to stand for Dharma, truth, wage the war, wage the war against a Dharma. Once you have waged the war, Gaze your sight upon me. You do what you have to do. Gaze your uh, sight upon me. Leave the rest to me. I will take care of. But you don't look for immediate fruits. Nishkama karma. Nishkama karma. Now look at my further, uh, what you call, uh, information that I like to share with you this evening. He has quoted Luke, uh, Gita chapter 2, 4, what not. But in course of time, in some other context, they also refer to John's Gospel. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 18, when Lord Jesus was brought to the court of Pilate, when Pilate asked him, are you a king? They are all the time using the word kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Are you a king? When Jesus answered, are you saying this one on your own or somebody reported the matter to you? Then Pilate asked the question, what's your kingdom? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is different from your kingdom. My value system is different from your value system. I stand for certain visions and they do not correspond to the visions and they do not correspond to your visions. When Pilate asked further, 
Jesus said, I have come to bear witness to truth. For truth, I was born. For truth, I lived. He did not say the next sentence. For truth, I'm ready to sacrifice myself. But he said something else. Jesus says, and that is recorded in the gospel according to St. John, at chapter number 18, verses 32 onward. Look at the data. He says, Jesus said, those who accepted me, that means his gospel, they walk in truth. I tell you, my dear friends, Gandhiji liked this particular passage. He put both Gita and gospel together. From Gita, he got it, God is truth. From uh, gospel, he got it, truth is God. Anybody who has received me, they walk in truth. And that particular Lord Jesus, you know, we know, but still I have to highlight. He said, I am the truth. Or John's Gospel chapter 4, he will say, a time is coming. You can see, find God in truth. And what she, God in truth and in spirit. I'd like to uh, give you further details in case you want any further explanation on this one. I'm at your service at the end of my presentation. Before I move on to the fourth point, I got one or two points to add over here. That means Gandhi is not just philosophy, much more theology, defined God as the ultimate reality and the embodiment of truth. And he's the totality of truth. And whereas you and I are called to stand for truth day in and day out. And here, here see the meditation of Gandhiji. He has not put this one as I'm now telling you. But when you go into slightest, we get this message. So kindly permit me to take the liberty, put it this way. In many places, it says, I am putting them all together for our uh, presentation, for my presentation, for our uh, uh, common reflection. In one place, he says, when I think of truth, when I think of truth, I pray to God. When truth is God, then I think of truth. I need to stand for truth. And this is the truth. And when you come to that sort of conclusion, through a certain discernment, and you are coming to a certain dedication, it's only mental level mind level but still when you think of truth look at the way Gandhiji puts you are praying to God that's a prayer that will be pleasing to God you can call him Lord Lord but you think of truth that will be much more pleasing to God and see the, my, my, the second uh, what you call it uh, way of putting it when you speak truth Speak truth. When you speak truth, you praise God. You glorify God. It's not only saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. It's not only saying, I praise you, honor you, I glorify you. But if you are uh, not really speaking the truth out, all this will be humbug. And I am taking liberty to uh, say something more than what Gandhiji has underlined. But you see that my line of thought. That's a challenge. It's there I began with this one at the end of this uh, presentation at 8 o'clock. I said, when we end this one, something should have happened to you, happened to me, happened to us. Not only really information, but such a reformation. Not only really reformation, some transformation. So we have to get that particular concept and we need to concretize it. It's not verbal praising, glorifying God. That may please God, but he will check your conscience. He will check my conscience. And much more he will check whether I say truth, come what may. Come what may. Or whether I keep only inside truth and speak quite the opposite outside. I become, as I said earlier, a muck. I become a fake. Look at the next one. That is, when you do truth, that means when you establish, bring truth. Look at the way 
Gandhiji would end it. You bring God here and now. Though it's ultimate reality. And they are joining to her, pilgriming to her, the ultimate, the omega point. But still, they can bring him here. When? Then we stand for truth. We establish truth. We do truth. I tell you, this he did it even when he was in South Africa. He went to South Africa in 1893. He was invited there by merchants to take up the cases in the, like in the civil courts over there. He did not go for any mission, even for his own business. And because after studying Bartala, when he came to Gujarat, things were not going on very well. And two years he did not, uh, what you call it, he could not even get back something for his livelihood, much more for his family. But thank God, thank God, a, a Gujarati businessman who wanted to take a case up there in South Africa, invited Gandhi over there as his advocate. He jumped at the idea, went over. Though his family members were not happy with that, that decision. But since he was not getting enough over here, he thought better you can fetch some money uh, over there, he went over. And the case got over. Then he saw, and there are a lot of what we call it, uh, oppression over there. And especially when the local elections were taking place in South Africa, he was in Pretoria, Johannesburg, and whatnot. Then but what not not. But now look at the detail, look at the detail. Then uh, that uh, the right to vote was not given to the local South African people if they are not white. At the time, the right to vote, uh, sorry, right to vote was reserved only for Europeans. The white scheme. And the racism was there. And he took up the case. He fought for them. He always them. Because they are the people who are keep, uh, making the South Africa to come up. And they are the people who are sweating, if not shedding their blood, for the enrichment of the nation. Then when the election comes, or when the kind of a democratic process happens, and you suppress them, erase his words. And you want to do as I said earlier, truth. He wanted to bring justice. He wanted to establish the truth. He went through. And he organized them, protested. And uh, when the work uh, time came, he, he experimented non cooperation. All in Adimsa level. Even the protestation was in non violent way. But he tested, and the people tested for. That means they got the right. I tell you, it is there before returning to India. He returned to India in there 1915. Just the previous year, 1914, when things were becoming rather successful for him, as far as the justice and the truth is concerned, uh, in, the, in that particular arena, in the small way, but still, that was a kind of a history making arguments. And the people over there called him Mahatma. The very title was given to him by the people in South Africa just one year before he returned to India. He came as such. He went as a lawyer, simple lawyer, simple Atma. But he came back after 21 years, after 21 solid years over there. When he came back in the year 1915, he became, he was Mahatma. Why? He thought, thought, he was thinking all the time truth, speaking truth, and doing, bringing truth. And in his own uh, way of understanding, when he was thinking truth, uh, 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 truth, and he was praying, when he was speaking truth, uttering, muttering, communicating truth, and speaking and delivering the truth, and he was Praising God, glorifying God, praising to God. And then he did truth. And he established truth. With all the struggles. Going through what we call it uh, uh, a gimsa process. And that he called it Satyagrata. It's a kind of a uh, movement for truth. When he established it, he was bringing God here and now. Good. My third point is over with this one. 
Any further explanation? I come, can come to you later when you raise the question. That is a very interesting one. God is truth. But in the profound understanding, truth is God. And the, when we say the truth is God, it's a pure consciousness. It's not mere, it's not just merely abstaining from untruth, but standing for justice. And not just for yourself, but much more for the sake of the other, and for the least and the last, for the oppressed and the suppressed, and people who are marginalized or pushed to the periphery, in the words of uh, our, our Pope Francis. And then we also can become, if I'm permitted to say, Mahatmas. Look at the day I started and I'm ending this particular point. He was going by Bhagavan. He was going by Brahman. He was going by Ishwar. Then he was also going by Maha Ishwar. But at the end of this one, he became Maha Atma. Because he had a new discovery, a unique discovery, a challenging and inviting, inspiring, if not demanding discovery of the divinity. God is truth, but truth is God. Good. From there, I am moving on to the fourth point of my presentation. Because by 7.30, I should be, by around 7.30, I should conclude all my six points. The fourth one is Suvaraj. That is self-rule. It's one of another, another, what you call it, um, uh, salient feature, another uh, salient feature of the personality. If not the theology of Gandhiji, self rule, Swaraj. Here I like to bring in certain uh, what we call psychological details. Because when you go into the writings of Gandhiji, they find he has got this particular thought, which I'm going to now explain to you at the back of his head. I have to tell you honestly, he is he did not say anything that I'm going to say immediately. But in order to explain Suvaraj, self-rule, I need to bring this particular detail. What is that one? <clears throat> the mat any mature person, you know it, any mature person should have certain self-esteem, self-dignity, self-honor, self-confidence, self-knowledge. Every word can be explained, but there is no need. You know, I know you are following my line of thought. But all put together, it should give you three more details. What is that one? Self-direction. A mature person doesn't need anybody to direct him or direct her. Self-direction. If you don't lead, uh, what you call, go ponder over the life experience of Gandhiji, we find, come what may, even when his own Congress people or their leaders, or those who are working along with him in the freedom movement, when they did not agree with him many a time, many a time, many a time, he said, you can have the freedom. But I know what I am now doing, and I like to direct me. It's up to the people to accept me. Shall I tell you, 1930, when the South, then the movement, then the movement, then the what? So the salt movement, not a single great leader agreed with him. Gandhi said, no, it has something to convey to the British Raj. When they are now imposing salt tax, salt tax, that means the least and the poorest will be suffering because of that taxation. And he said, no, we will prepare our own salt. And then thereby, non-cooperation in terms of paying the tax. You know the details, I don't need to elaborate. But what I want to say is, namely, that particular one came as a huge moment in the freedom struggle of India. And that 1930, that salt uh, march, uh, certainly gave a jerk and a jolt to the colonial powers. Powers, to begin with the uh, British colony and its power. In a self-direction. And many times he went through what we call it hunger fast, hunger, hunger strike, and fasting unto death. 
He was gunned down on the 30th of January 1948, just about, uh, about 15, 16 uh, days before. That is on the 12th of January 1948. And that was the last fasting. And I tell you, at the time, he was already 78, cross 79. And all the leaders, they even wanted to impress upon him to give up that idea. But he had a point to make. And he wanted to achieve something. Though you know that he, he seemed to say at that time, I'm nearing my, and uh, nearing my life. The, miss, the end is nearing. I mean, the evening of my life. But I, even if I go, let me go with the message given to the humanity. Because just about three months before, on the August, uh, four months before, on the August 15th, 1947, we got the independence. But Gandhi could not stomach the partition. And much more, the commotion that followed the partition on the 14th of August, Pakistan, 15th of August, 1947, India. He could not stomach. And he himself said it very plainly. This is not the freedom that I was looking forward to. This is not the independence that we should have achieved. And something went wrong very hugely. And because uh, people are killing one another, in the name of religion, the name of language, the name of geography, and what not, what not. And you know, in order to bring certain harmony, harmony, religious harmony, and the cultural harmony, and uh, just about 16, 17, 18 days before his uh, assassination on the 12th of January, 1948, he began the first and took that. But uh, as I said, he had no self-direction. He had a point to make and he wanted to make it rather sharply. The fellow, uh, what we call leaders, including then Prime Minister of India, that is Jawaharlal Nehru, impressed upon Gandhi, he seemed to have said this way, namely, if something would have happened prior to independence, okay, we had British to blame. Now we have got the independence. And I have come to be the Prime Minister. And the cabinet is functioning. The government has been already established. Anything happens to you, you have no explanation to give. And we, we have to put our heads down on shame. No excuse or no escape available. So Nehru tried his always best to dissuade Gandhi from going for the fast. He had it. But I tell you, you would have known the history. That certainly made certain vibration. And the commotions came to certain level down. I cannot say totally it was out. That's all the historians say. But uh, the visibility of the commotion and uh, killing one another, what not, what not. All the torturing and butchering came at his down. And it has uh, certainly the, what you call the peace was emerging and at his race of hope was coming up and after a couple of days he gave up his uh, past because the leaders impressed upon him. But he showed his prudish method. He has got a self-direction. And that takes to the next one. Self-discipline. There are a number of theories about uh, the self-discipline and sexual, especially in terms of sexual arena on the part of Gandhiji. But one cannot deny the fact. He was a, a, a like a, what call it exemplary person in terms of self-discipline. Namely, he had his way of life, and he knew when to say yes and when to say no, even with reference to his own life. A life. For example, when the independence got on the 15th of August 1947, you know it. He was not in New Delhi. And he said no to the celebration. And he went over to Kolkata, where the Bengal is being divided, bifurcated. And the western part of the Bengal is becoming part of India. And the eastern part is now becoming Bangladesh at the time, at the day East Pakistan, eventually Bangladesh from 1971. Coming to that one, he had that particular self-disciplining to which he has to say yes, to which he has to say no as and when the time uh, comes up. I hear I like to recollect what Jesus said, sir, in the Sermon on the Mount, 
which was rather dear to Gandhiji. Verse number 37 and chapter number 5, Gospel according to St. Matthew, when Jesus says, say yes, when you have to say yes. Say no, when you have to say no. Push the point a little further. It's not only self-confidence, self-dignity, self-esteem, or self-direction, or self-discipline. Much more self-dedication. Self-dedication. In this one, I like to push the point further and give you this detail. He certainly loved Jesus. And he uh, even referred to Christ Jesus in many a way. And ultimately, when somebody asked him, what do you love most in the person of Jesus? And uh, Gandhiji seemed to have said, the self-sacrificing love of Jesus appeals to me very much. He was ready to empty himself, dedicate himself even to the extent of donating up to the last drop of his blood. He sacrificed himself. And so that others may have life and life and abundance. So the self-rule, the suvaraj, is not only to keep yourself intact, but even to donate yourself, sacrifice yourself, and deny yourself, and thereby offer yourself. And so that others may have life, life in abundance. I tell you, Gandhiji referred to this one and said, in many a time, he referred to Christ Jesus, but ultimately he said, eventually, in course of time, he said, the most appealing aspect of the man and the message and the life of Christ Jesus is nothing but his sacrificial love. As a, a kind of a culmination of the self rule, Suvarat. From there, I move on to my next point, point number five. That is, he wanted to see, not in his own lifetime, he himself said it. I go in by the Hindu way of life and the Hindu understanding, going by the karma, samsara, I will also have rebirth. And he put it. In this particular life, I may not be able to see, but we are sowing the seeds. And in my further lives, the rebirth, I wish to see a liberated society. That's, uh, that's the next point, the fifth point, liberated society. I tell you, when he talks about liberated society, it is, uh, he talks in terms of going beyond all the religions, and all the cultures, all the uh, differentiations, all the discriminations, all the aspects of departmentalizations. And at the time, he says there will be oneness of humanity. In that context, he even refers to our own uh, India. He says India should be becoming independent, but should not live for itself. And the ultimate goal of the independence of India should be to bring forth in course of time, a liberated humanity. What does it mean? A liberated India should offer itself and much more resources for the welfare of the total humanity. So that even all the other countries also will become independent. And much more, they will become interdependent. Word, term used by Gandhiji. He says independence is only a first step. But a liberated society will be interdependent. Today, people also talk about, sociology talk about interindependent. That's another step. But Gandhiji did not use that word, interindependent. But he did use the word interdependent. So that all the nations, all the countries, all the continents, all the communities will have their own specialities and salient and special and specific elements. But they will give and take. In that particular process, they will be having certain, what we call a, a life, a world, humanity, colored by pluralism. Nelson Mandela, in course of time, in the year 1994, when he took charge as the first black elected president of South Africa, in that one, he refers to Gandhi. In the course of time, he even elaborated Nelson Mandela. He said, 
Gandhi used the word interdependent or a liberated society. But the Nelson Mandela word is not his coinage, but certainly he popularized the term after his uh, delivery of uh, uh, the presidential address on the 10th of May 1994. He said the whole world should become rainbow world. He was uh, starting with the reference to his own South Africa. Different races, different colors, different denominations, different churches. And now come together to make a new South Africa. And Nelson Mandela said, as a part of New Earth and New Heaven, verses 1 to 7, Book of Revelation, a new earth, new heaven. And he says, today it has become new South Africa. And he uh, used the word ra rainbow South Africa. Then he appealed to them, ah, all the presidents, all the prime ministers, all the leaders of the countries gathered over there. Eventually, when he was called to address the General Assembly of the United Nations Organization, you are known. He said the same. A rainbow world. I tell you, Nelson Mandela, in his uh, presentation on this issue, referred to Gandhi. He said, I learned from him. Because he also took pride in that way. Gandhiji started all this movement, wanted to have the liberated society in his own country, that is, in Nelson's country, South Africa. Eventually, 1915, he got back to India. And eventually, when India got liberation independent, he said, India should be at the service of the total world. I like to quote here, quote Gandhiji himself right now. In one of his writings, he says, the world should become our family. The world, whole world is our family. We need to have that particular familiar spirit. And that particular spark should make us to live in harmony, peace. They even brought in political economy. He says it can be done by the politics. Not any politics. It's a politics of the powerless, the poorest. They should have their need basic needs and so that they will live in uh, peace and joy and not just equality he highlighted equity and the new world and uh, should have that particular way of life and brought in uh, what you call political economy and brought in religious pluralism he brought in cultural mutual enrichment he said every culture has got its own rich richness resources and the culture should really should have a certain osmosis and should enrich one another and that way the whole liberated society should emerge in course of time he said it i may not see it in my lifetime but i believe in going by his own hindu faith he said i i would be reborn and in the course of time in my next births i'd like to see and that's my dream and he even put it uh, very strongly. Nothing should take me away from this particular dream of mine. Garbage said it. Again, I can go on. I'm ending here with my last point, point number six. That is going to be only a few sentences. I am finishing in time uh, within one hour or so. I started, I think, if I remember correctly. It was already about 6.35 past. Now I'm 7.30-31. In another couple of minutes, I should be finishing. And look at the... Uh, the sixth is nothing but this one, which I highlighted at the beginning. Now I'm coming back. I like, highlighted at the start of my presentation. Now all the more, I should put it very strongly. What is that one? You and I have to become Mahatma. Gandhi said, my life is my message. Now you have to say to yourself and they way to say others, my life is my message. In theological language, biblical language, we also say you and I should become fifth gospel. There are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John to read. But the fifth gospel to realize. The four gospels, they are verbal. The fifth gospel is actual. 
The four gospels are nothing but an invitation. The fifth gospel is implementation. And the four gospels, that for that matter, the whole of Bible is nothing but a challenge. Giving you certain conviction. But the fifth gospel, living gospel, your life, my life, when we want to also attain, uh, we, we need to attain that, uh, what we call, uh, attain what we call uh, Mahatma Wood. We need to see that those convictions born out of the word of God and the values of the gospel, justice, freedom, love for the least, coming out of the mouth of Jesus, should become somewhere concrete in our lives. As Gandhi himself would say, we may not be able to live totally perfectly. And the total perfection may not come. But at least we need to promote ourselves and accelerate the process, become more and more truthful, more and more honest, more and more attentive, more and more sincere, more and more self-disciplined. I'm now synthesizing, summarizing, and the more and more sacrificing, the more and more inclusive, the more and more belonging to a rainbow society, more and more getting humanized individually, collectively, more and more evangelized, that way more and more divinized. I like to end my presentation again with a powerful quote of Gandhiji. Be the, the change that you propose to others. Be the T H E E. Be yourself the change that you propose to others. Another way of putting it, walk the talk. Another way of putting it before you propose to others, you practice, then you teach, then you preach. None of us going to be under person perfect, under person holy. As Pope Francis says in one of his writings, even the saints are got that effect canonized or put on the altar or on the over the pedestal, even they at one time or other. They went against the demands of the gospel. But we take the total picture. Then we beatify or canonize. And then we respect them and we salute them. And then they are come to be Magatmas. Be the, the change that you propose. I pray for you. You also pray for me. That this particular presentation gives you and gives me that orientation, motivation, and the motivation is getting translated into mobilization so that we will dedicate ourselves as a living gospels, making our life our message and growing in grace and growing in wisdom that we're growing in Mahat mood of our human food. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have the questions. I request Laila to kindly read out the questions to Father and Jerry. All right, Father. So there are a few questions that have come in into the chat box. Uh, the first question is about the relevance of Gandhian philosophy today, in today's world. How do we need to apply it? Let me get your question again. Yes, Father. So the question... I'll put it so that I can read it and answer, uh, answer exactly. I mean, I'm asking you whether you can give the question to me. Oh, Father, it's in the chat box. Are you able to access that? Uh, the mine is, uh, since my, what we call it, uh, the laptop is a common one. It's not working. I don't want to touch and get it uh, out, uh, out of order. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah. I'll repeat Please. the question. Yeah. Um, so the first question is about the relevance yes. of Gandhian philosophy in today's world. 
how do we need to apply it i thought i said it more than once but i don't mind the repeating i said it's no more philosophy it's a theology is nothing but you stand for truth good enough and to the extent possible that you are ready to ah uh, what you call it uh, go beyond and think of others and this is also said by others but gandhi ji applied it in a very very concrete way and he did live it and thereby he stands before the as an embodiment on another way of putting it as you are asking is gandhi philosophy that is theology really relevant today very much why 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 no philosophy no theology is going to be relevant eternally but you have to interpret it i have to interpret it and make it relevant there is a word called we have to relevantize if you and i could make the message of moses who lived about 36 centuries ago or we can uh, relevantize words of Amos, who lived at least 28 centuries ago, uh, before. If you and I can uh, relevantize words of St. Paul, who lived 2,000 years ago, they can also relevantize the words of Gandhi, who lived just the last century. It's up to us. You cannot Xerox it. You cannot copy it. But you need to interpret it, contextualize it, and concretize it and contemporize it and that way you have to make it relevant and then during the session i have said it repeatedly even in the very beginning even if you remember that my my what we call my second point and uh, referring to the centenary of this this year with the reference to yes uh, going by Dhoti, giving up i said okay we are not going to follow gandhi uh, literally but but solidarity as part of spirituality contributing to the humanity or the last point sixth point i said it making your life message standing for the values of the gospel because he quoted gospel and if you have visited, visited rajkat at new delhi the gandhi samadhi at the very entrance you see the beatitudes matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12 are put over there over there and then because he himself said it that appealed to me a lot and in one particular context he said it even if the whole world collapses he needs only two pillars to stand by and one pillar is a chapter number two Bhagavad Gita there is Lord Krishna talking to Arjuna about standing for Dharma the second pillar he referred to Matthew's gospel chapter five and he says the attitude is good enough why? Verse number 12 of the values, we only we think of other things. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, meek, peacemakers. True. And the last beatitude is demand. When you stand for, blessed are those who stand for justice and righteousness, you will be persecuted. But your reward is great. Even your prophets of the old also were done the same way. You find it, that particular sentence, that particular beatitude appealed a lot to Gandhi. Look at the way I'm concluding my response. If Gandhi can contextualize the beatitude and Gandhi can concretize the beatitude and make his life a journey toward truth, justice, righteousness, they can also do it. Thank you for that answer, Father. Um, the next question well, is on nice. the Welcome. The next question is about, um, of course, Gandhi's resilience. He was very self-motivated and he had a lot of challenges. As you had mentioned, he faced racism. Of course, it was a time of colonizers. So in I really appreciate the one. I got the question. Yes. When circumstances are challenging and the living is tough, what motivates one to stick to non-violent beliefs so fearlessly? Or uh, fear, sorry, uh, fiercely, fierce, fiercely. But now look at the, my response. I really thank the person who raised this question because it gives me an opportunity to quote Gandhi, said something else in some other context. What is that? 
he said my non violence is not exactly passive is a dynamic one is a active one the next says at the what we call a jerk and gives a certain shake and say it makes certain vibration so non violence is not passivity inactivity indifference insensitivity but he said it is active one dynamic one now look at the example given by gandhi himself it is there i thank the person who raised this question because as i said earlier it gives me an opportunity to honor to refer to gandhi again he says he though he talks hypothetically but uh, when the questioner said living is tough now he refers to one of the tough living context what is that one a woman is sexually assaulted the woman is being, uh, being raped gandhi sits up i will not say non violence i will not say just surrender to the sexual assault i will not say that you need to simply accept the rape as such you know what he suggested you resist you don't cooperate but things don't move comes the ultimate point he says bite the persons you got teeth you got nails prick the person got itchy got itchy got itchy so the non violence is not uh, as kind of a pass like you say mark of passivity is a giving a certain no, what we call vibration so that things will happen justly but if that's it, it is not justly happening and just is being moved to further is us to that's what we call the last resort here i remember another example given by another person because we have to put them together and that is called marx he also he he gave another example Karl Marx example, because Gandhi knew this example given by Karl Marx, uh, who died only in the year eighteen eighty three. But in your way, he knew Karl Marx because he had also referred to Marxism in some of his uh, thoughts. You Now coming to that one, Karl Marx gave another example. He said, "The delivery time comes. The woman is passing through the labor pain. The natural process of." in the ejection as to take place the child has to be delivered that is natural in case in case in case the labor pain only continues the delivery is not happening and you cannot be passive you cannot be non violent you cannot display uh, observe and watch the labor pain of the woman karl marx says apply violent means that is make a surgery Cesarean surgery is violent. That's the last resort. Don't jump at it at the very outset. If nothing works, the child has been now brought out. Earlier they, they even used forceps. I myself was a forceps boy. I refused to come out of my mother, and I was pulled out violently. My my mother was delighted. the service bond but now look at the same gandhi ji refers to the context of the self uh, sexual assault and the living is tough as per the question uh, don't simply surrender if nothing works ah karl marx talked in terms of delivery now i like to appeal to jesus jesus also promoted non violence Gandhi himself referred to Jesus as a prototype of non-violence, but Jesus also employed violence. Gospels bear witness to it. John's Gospel, chapter two. He violently threw out the thieves, the business people, out of the campus of the temple at Jerusalem. That's the last resort. If you now check Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, this particular driving of the thieves and the merchants from the other uh, campus of the temple at Jerusalem, that happened as per the synoptic gospel at the end. 
towards the end of their life, public ministry of Jesus. But John, who wrote the, uh, the gospel towards the end of the first century, possibly you would have come across the Matthew, Mark and Luke, but he purposely put that particular event at the very outset. Chapter number two, chapter number two. Because he wants to give an idea, Jesus was not simply surrendering to the dehumanizing de situation. And he was ready to raise his voice and even take the whip. On Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, Jesus employs violent words. So violence need not be only in terms of AK-47. Violence need not be only in terms of uh, what we call knife or any other instrument. Violence, as per the definition, can be also in terms of cutting words. Matthew 23, full of the violent words, uttered and muttered by Jesus. So we learn from these people. The question is with the reference to Gandhi. But I took the liberty to move to Karl Marx. But since you and I are now, uh, 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 by and large, are uh, uh, Catholic Christians and whatnot, baptized people, and we need to also refer to Christ Jesus, who also gives a message. Don't be passive. When noun violence works, yes. And there's a last one, there's a just means, and at that particular time, but how that violence should be manifested, you should be done. Why the Fatuli Tuti, and which was released on the 4th of October 2020 by the Pope Francis, he refers to says no question of just war or what we call it holy war. And nobody should have the right to take the life out from somebody. However, we need to put the pressure such a way that uh, things happen better as per the master plan of God. Good. I've given a little longer uh, what you call response, but that explains a lot of things for our consideration. I tell you what I said even now, don't take it as the last word. Uh, this is uh, when the question came, I, uh, I felt like uh, I, uh, giving it comprehensively. But uh, it is up to you to consider, ponder over, and see whether that uh, one my response makes any sense, then you accept it. But we need to have that particular freedom. And you have got uh, your freedom to accept or reject. In that way also, even about Gandhi uh, philosophy, uh, much more Gandhi, Gandhian theology, again, we are not going to swallow, but we chew. And take whatever you see, uh, meaningful, we take in, we appropriate, and we really, in That okay, we should have the liberty and the joy of putting away. That's the way we have to go. Good. Any further question from anybody? Uh, yes, there are a few. Um, they will be presented on the screen for you. By the way, how many questions are there? Roughly? Just a couple. Oh, very good because I want to budget my time so that they will end on time at 8 o'clock. Because towards the end, I have something to uh, uh, to summarize as a sort of conclusion to the whole program. The question goes like this. Did Gandhi only patronize the cause of the untouchables? His coined word origin remained today as a new currency of vote back or social discrimination. What was his differences with Ambedkar? Please comment. I tell you, there are two or three things I have to comment on the very question. No more origin. They are not allowed to use. It's being banned. Though Gandhi did use the word origin. And he gave the meaning called origin, people of God. But it had its own connotation. And the connotation, possibly you are aware of it. If not, you better you come to know of it. That is, and the origins are, are none other than sons and daughters of temple prostitutes born out of Devadasi system temple prostitutes and at the time and the women available in the temple as prostitutes and they, in course of time when they get conceived and then uh, delivery takes place when the children are born at that time those who made use of them 
and who enjoy the flesh of the plastic tools. They said they are not our children. That is our religion. Gandhi knew it. But he brought in uh, what they call it a uh, new connotation to the term and he popularized it. But Pule, Jodi Pule, who lived in Pune, Maharashtra, objected to that one course of time, uh, 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 objected to that one. Ambedkar, coming to the point, he certainly disliked this word origin. Ambedkar said, I know my father, I know my mother. And then I'm not born out of temple prostitutes. Don't call me Harijan. When Gandhi was alive, and Ambedkar made this emphatic comment, don't give us that title. And then we will, why are you, who are you to give the uh, uh, name to us? And then he popularized, Ambedkar popularized what Bule, Mahatma Bule of Pune uh, proposed, Dalits. Today the word is used, Dalits. And that is Sanskrit word, the broken people, passive language. They are not breaking themselves. Somebody is sitting over their back and they are breaking their back and allow, not allowing them to come up. And they are broken people, broken people. I repeat, passive ones, not active ones. And that is Dalits. So better not to use the word Harichan. And when B.P. Singh, when he was Prime Minister of India, that is 1989, and then this particular bill was passed. And if somebody uses the word Harijan, that is a common a condemnable. And they can be penalized. Cut to the point. And the question says, in what way it differed from Ambedkar? Ambedkar, the Pune Pact. There are a lot of details, but I just give one. Ambedkar differed uh, from Gandhi, Gandhi on this issue. Don't call us Harijans, and we like to call ourselves types. Number two. Ambedkar was promoting or proposing, and British was even ready to offer separate consistency for what we call uh, for Dalits, uh, Dalits, untouchables, and Dalits, untouchables. And at that time, Gandhi said it will divide a human a society, it's an Indian society. He said uh, the dream of a new India all should live in all. But now, once you know, break consistency on this particular point. And it will divide the new Indian society. We may get the independence from colonial powers. We may not be able to get the what we call uh, liberation and freedom, independence from our casteism. Eventually, at Pune, you know, Gandhi went on uh, Uncle Stack. Ambedkar was brought in in order to save the life of uh, Gandhi. Ambedkar agreed for a compromise and gave up the idea of asking for this special. Uh, what called segment from their territory or much more for a democracy. Details are many, but this is good enough for our purpose at that, this particular time. Let me now uh, conclude response to this question this way. Namely, every time has its own, every time, historical time has its own specificities. If Gandhi were alive today, he may come out with a different one, which may even go along with Ambedkar to a certain extent. Or even Ambedkar would modify because there is a saying, and you know it, that is context creates consciousness. So the historical context of Gandhi, historical context of Ambedkar, that is different from, and those uh, that uh, the, the, their contexts are different from our context. So we need to have that particular mind of reading the context. As we say, we are, it has been said to us, we have to read the signs of the time. And today they say also signs of the space. Time may be the same, but space may be different. You are listening to me possibly in Goa, from Goa. Whereas I'm talking from Chennai. Time is the same, but space is different. And I need to go by the demands of the state of Tamil Nadu. And you need to go by the uh, demands and needs of the state of Goa. Space is different. Why? Context is nothing but time plus space. This is philosophy. And accordingly, we need to go. Let us learn from Gandhi. Let us also learn from Ambedkar. Both though they differ because of their different contexts. At least this particular one we need to learn. We go by our context and we are responsible Responsive, responsible and responsive 
to the needs of our own living context. Good. The last question. I am told there is one more question. What is the question? Admin. 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 Oh yes, no, Admin has joined now. We know that Gandhiji thoughts some how we control the violence of nature on nature, but how we control the violence of terrorism. We also know that terrorists thought that what they want, but how we convince them about non-violence. Good. Uh, this is as I said, this is partly answered, but it's also a loaded question. It cannot be answered like that. But at least one thing can be said. We keep up the flag of non-violence with all the explanations that I given. It's not total non-violence, but it's a quali uh, qualified non-violence. Qualified non-violence. Going by the need of the time and the space. Going by the issue and the concern. Going by the cries and the causes of the least and the last. And that way, it is to be qualified. Okay, terrorism coming up. And especially now we talk about what we call uh, Afghanistan, Taliban, etc. But still, we need to offer non-violence. Why? He still gives us this particular one. The thesis, antithesis, in course of time, uh, brings out synthesis. If we say, under violence, terrorism is thesis, happening all around in one way or other. And we will still keep up non-violence, and as I said, qualify non-violence as an antithesis. But they both are not the end of the road, end of the story. A time will come and there both will birth a synthesis and that will be the betterment of history and the betterment of humanity and the betterment of the vision of Gandhiji and the betterment of the vision of Christ Jesus. And I like to end the session with a prayer that you and I, going by this last 90 minutes of our reflections on Gandhian theology other than Gandhian philosophy, and then we need to have that particular dynamism and move on with greater radicality of our own personalities, standing by truth, that is Satya, Sat. And then we become Satya Gregi, that means we are ready to sacrifice in order to think truth, speak truth, do truth, and establish kingdom of God in the words of Jesus, establish Ram Raj, in the words of Gandhiji, established classless society in the words of Karl Marx, and established casteless society in the words of Ambedkar. All put together, a new India. All put together, book of Revelation, a new earth, new heaven, and engineered by, engineered by a new humanity. For this, may God bless you, God bless me, God bless all of us. We ask for the blessing I know it for this particular intention I know. of the whole God, God the Father, the God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Over. I am finished exactly at 8 o'clock. First, Laila, to a couple of No, no, no I am responsible in case the time goes beyond. I'm looking no at the problem. Clock. I just have the vote of the hands. Yes, Father, thank you so much for that very insightful talk. I love the way you approached the questions as well. And although, oh, can you hear me, Father? I'm not getting you excited. A little louder, please. Okay. Um, thank you for the very insightful talk, Father. We've, I love the way that you approach the questions. And we love the way that you phrase your words. And although we may not have had this uh, talk physically, you have left a great impact on us mentally. Thank you for your words. And I would also like to thank the Friends of Jesuits for organizing this very lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you for your thank you. May God bless us all. Thank you so much. As I said earlier, at the end of the session, we go with this Gandhian spark so that we become the change that we propose. Our lives become our message of the gospel. Thank you once again.